um, welcome everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be running this session to talk a bit about Catalyzer, what we do here at Catalyzer as well as introduce you to some of our amazing alumni um, and really tell you about our story, um, you know, what, um, you know, the sort of journey has been for Catalyzer as well as introducing, um, you know, some of the amazing stories of our alumni um, who are here with us today. So I've got Devin and Alana with me. Um, and they'll talk to you shortly. Uh, but I just wanted to start with acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation um, here in Sydney from where I'm speaking from, um, and paying my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Welcome once again. It's really awesome to have all of you here. Um, so the way this session is going to run is I'll give a brief introduction about the story and history of Catalyzer. Um, then I will get uh, both of my panelists, Eliana and Devon, to introduce themselves and tell you a bit more about their story, you know, what they've been working on, what is something that's exciting them, uh, and then we'll go into some Q&A. Um, so I believe you have access to Slido, so you can ask any questions as well, and I've got a few questions prepared for our panelists as well. Um, so to kick off, um, just introduction about myself and Catalyzer. Um, I am Muslim Niftakar. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Catalyzer. I came to Australia back in 2013, um, myself as an international student, um, and initially, I struggled after, you know, having an engineering degree from Pakistan, studying here in Australia, doing a master's to get into a meaningful job. Uh, and I, you know, worked doing a lot of casual work at 7-Eleven, at BP and so on. Uh, and that got me really frustrated um, because, you know, I, I wanted to do something where I could actually use my skill sets. Um, and so I decided um, that I wanted to, you know, apply my skills in a meaningful way through business and through entrepreneurship. Um, so I took part in the program. Uh, called School for Social Entrepreneurs City Youth Launchpad Program. It's a mouthful, um, but really what it was all about was um, just supporting you know young people based in Western Sydney and helping them you know start their own social enterprise. Um, so I went in with an idea that wasn't catalyzed; it was something else. Uh, but like a lot of other entrepreneurs, it got um, you know invalidated pretty quickly because I found other people already doing something similar, um, and so I pivoted and um, and you know talked to some amazing mentors who told me to try and focus on a problem that I've personally faced. And for me, that was this issue of unemployment, but particularly underemployment that is sort of faced by a lot of immigrants and refugees who come to Australia. Um, and so really, uh, you know, Catalyzer Foundation was set on that, so my own personal journey um, and to be able to, and I was thinking, well, if I wanted to start my own business um, as a way to, you know, to get uh, around these sort of employment issues, um, then I know that there are so many other talented migrants and refugees who already are in Australia um, so wouldn't it be great if you set an incubator, just like the one that I was in, that can help all of them. Um, so that was, I guess, the sort of like beginning of that dream. Um, and we started back in 2016. We ran our pilot with about 10 people, really scrappy, like a lot of founders are, didn't really know much about, you know, entrepreneurship and how do you run these programs. So I apologize to some of our sort of pilot uh, participants, uh, but, but the program went really well. Um, even in our sort of first cohort, we had out of those 10 people, three of them actually started a business that's still running. Um, so we, we, that was an amazing start. But since then, I've spent a lot of time in learning from some amazing people across the startup ecosystem, both here in Australia as well as overseas. Um, and really about, you know, understanding about start startups and social enterprise and how do you help, um, you know, um, sort of new founders um, to take something from an idea and build it into um, an actual product and get it out on the market. Um, so we've been running now four years. We've supported around 400 sort of migrantpreneurs, as we like to call them, so migrant and refugee entrepreneurs. And out of them, they've started roughly 150 businesses um, in all sorts of verticals and industries. Uh, and we've got two amazing alumni today who will tell you a bit about you know what they're doing out of that 150, um, as well as uh, I guess the other thing about Catalyzer is that we're really proud that you know over half of our um, you know, migrantpreneurs are women, um, you know, who have been uh, running these businesses and sort of at the forefront of creating startups and social enterprise in Australia. Um, and so really I wanted to put this panel together just to be able to tell you about our story as well as introduce you to our um, amazing alumni. Um, and then I guess open it up to your questions. Um, and, and then I'll talk a bit more about, you know, the future of Catalyzer and where we're going as well. Um, 
So after running for four years and obviously coming into this year, one of the things we've, you know, all faced is, you know, the C word, the COVID-19, which has, you know, affected um, all of us significantly. For us at Catalyzer, it meant that a lot of our programs that were happening, um, you know, face-to-face -face had to be quickly changed and, and moved online. And so now the programs we were running previously in Sydney and Melbourne uh, in person are now happening online. But what it also meant was that it gave us a big opportunity to be actually able to scale um, what we're doing, not just in Sydney and Melbourne, but also across Australia. So we did some of this testing even prior to COVID. Uh, and Devin is an example of that because he is actually from NT and he'll talk a bit about, you know, the work that he's doing. Um, but really it's about, you know, like how do we actually, you know, have migrapreneurs at the heart of that economic recovery process uh, over the in next uh, coming years. And so really uh, like what I, what I want to sort of hear from some of my panelists as well as from all of you is your questions and your thinking around, well, yeah, how can migrants refugees who are in Australia who are skilled and talented and qualified play a role in, in this economic recovery that I think all of us have to own up to and all of us have to do um, something about. Um, so that's enough for me. Um, I wanted to sort of hand it over to um, Devon to share a bit about your story, what you're doing at HR Partner, um, and, and you know, what was your experience like with Catalyzer, and just you know, tell us a bit about you. Sure. Thanks, Usman, and, and it's a great honour to be here today too. I'm really happy to be you know, chosen to, to speak today. Uh, hi, Leanna. Pleased to meet you as well. Um, yeah, so my story is, uh, my name is Devon. Uh, I'm 53 years old, turning 54 next week, I think it is. And about five years ago, I decided to uh, start a startup called HR Partner based around an HR uh, SaaS platform. Uh, but, you know, sort of going back a little bit, you know, my, my heritage is Sri Lankan. I was born uh, in Malaysia and my family moved to Australia back in 1978, I think it was. So about 40 years, you know, 40 plus years ago. So I've been a migrant for a long time and running my own business in Australia for a long time as well. But this is my first sort of foray into the international SaaS space with, uh, with HR Partner. And, uh, you know, it was a challenge. You know, I thought it was going to be something fairly simple because I'd run businesses all my life, uh, you know, like local businesses. So I thought our uh, online business, not that much different, but, uh, you know, unfortunately when I did sort of start, I realized, you know, the challenges facing an online business is so different from that, you know, facing a, a traditional business, uh, you know. Um, so I, I went through, you know, various startup accelerator programs and then eventually I applied for Catalyzer program uh, back in 2018 and uh, Usman, you know, accepted my, my application uh, and I'm so grateful for that because uh, the learning that I got from being as part of the Catalyzer co cohort was just, was just amazing and I met some, you know, incredible people who are lifelong friends now. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's really highlights some, some of the challenges for, you know, people who are like new to Australia or just coming to Australia who maybe don't speak the language or, you know, have other, uh, um, you know, um, differences, I guess, from, from, from the Australian culture, you know, trying to start a business because, you know, it's always that, that sort of unspoken rule that, you know, migrants are, you know, are welcome here. Like I've had a great time in Australia. I love this country because everyone's so welcoming. But, you know, there's always this unspoken thought that, you know, if you're a migrant, you know, you just, you know, you assimilate, you don't rock the boat, you, you, you know, you, sort of, you know, stay quiet, behave yourself and you know, everything will work fine. But, you know, as, as startup people know, as, as entrepreneurs know, you know, you, you have to rock the boat sometimes. And so Catalyzer, you know, mingling with the, with other migrants you know it sort of taught me about you know how, how to do that respectfully how to, how to do that you know uh you know in a meaningful way so that you know you can you know show people that you all you want to do is make things better all you want to do is just build and and you know and and make you know australia your, your chosen country you know so much better and um and help the local economy that the local people and things like that as well so that that's you know one of, one of the biggest takeaways from from the catalyzer group for me which i you know really took to heart and i'm trying to live that every day as i as i grow the business and and, and things are going really well you know for us now like especially since uh, since catalyzer, like meeting some of those incredible and residents uh, uh, who are still in contact with today like you know i finished the course like two years ago but i still talk to them you know almost every every week and uh, you know the, the advice and the learnings and, and the support from that network is just you know absolutely incredible. And uh, I think you know it, it, everybody should just now explore the, the opportunity that the catalyzer can give you because uh, uh, it is it is quite uh, it's, it's hard to explain like you know how all encompassing it is. So, uh, so that's really yeah sort of my story with the catalyzer. Thanks very much, Devin. Thank you for sharing and, and for being so kind as well. Uh, I know that, uh, I mean, I can sort of tell a bit, a uh, quick sort of anecdote about Devin. Uh, when he participated in our programs, we ran them face-to-face -face in Sydney. 
Um, and he actually participated from um, NT. So he actually flew down for a couple of our events all the way from, from Darwin to Sydney uh, to participate and stay here for, you know, for a week or so. Um, so, you know, if you, uh, I mean, I think that sort of shows your commitment and, and the fact that, you know, you were so engaged with the community from the beginning, um, although you were like, you know, so like distance from everyone. And I think you're already, you know, like you're working remotely even before that was cool. Um, so well done. Um, I think it's also in the work that you guys are doing and I will sort of, you know, come back to you um, to ask a few more questions around, you know, how HR partner is going, what's been happening on that front. Uh, but over to you, Liana, um, sort of would love to hear your story um, and what you're working on at the moment, particularly with Swapa Porter. Hi, hi, Usman. Hi, Devan. Um, hi, everyone who is watching. I'm Liana. And first of all, I'd like to thank Usman and Catalarsis for the opportunity to share my entrepreneurial journey at Spark Festival. Uh, I'm supposed to talk a little bit, uh, give some in background information about myself. And I would describe myself as a kind of gypsy. I have been migrating since I was 17 years old. And the first time I migrated to my hometown, Rio de Janeiro, to another Brazilian city called Fortaleza. And the why I moved cities was because I had a dream to study fashion. And the only fashion university that I could afford was in Fortaleza. Then after my graduation at uni, I migrated again, and that time for sentimental reasons. I was in love with someone and I moved with him to Angola, a country on the west coast of Africa, where I spent four years of my life and lived the biggest growing experience I have had so far. Uh, I totally abandoned my comfort zone and I learned what was happiness for me when I was feeling unhappy. There was a point in Angola that uh, I found myself depressed and isolated, like we are just now in Melbourne, <laughs> isolated. And to cope with it, I started making videos for YouTube. It was a kind of therapy for me. I was expressing my creativity and having an impact on people's lives through my videos. So it made me realize that helping others was a source of satisfaction and happiness for myself. And I felt alive again. And in, during that flourishing time, I decided to start over my life in other place. And I chose Australia. I knew it, it would be a kind of reborn experience because I would learn a new language from the scratch. I would have new challenges and I also knew that it wouldn't be easy, but after all the experience I gained in Angola, I felt strong enough to, to tackle any challenge that crossed my path. So there I came to Australia on a student visa, looking forward to meeting my new and exciting life. I arrived in Melbourne in July of 2017 with only a suitcase full of winter clothes and because i was struggling to to find a job i struggled till summer i got worried about what clothes i would wear because i didn't have spare money to spend in a new wardrobe for the for the new season so a friend of mine suggested me going to the charity bin in, in the basement of the building we were living in and get some clothes from there. And to be honest, I didn't know what a charity bin was until that day. And it blew my mind when I saw it for the first time. I was shocked by the quality and amount of clothes I found there. And I couldn't stop asking myself why people throw away such great stuff. Anyway, I started my thrifting journey. That time, started wearing secondhand and following vintage pages on Instagram. And during this time, mm -hmm. I realized the impact, the negative impact of fashion industry on the environment. 
by watching the series War on Waste, I found out that every 10 minutes, six tons of textile are dumped into landfill. And I felt deep inside that I should do something about that. And back then, I, I had just started a diploma in business. And one of the assessments requirements was to pick a problem I'd like to, to solve, I really care about to solve. And I picked fashion waste. I became so obsessed with the problem that uh, I worked on that the in, during the entire course for one year. And it was funny because the solution that I, I found to solve the problem was pivoted twice. And by the end of the year, I was feeling so motivated, putting so much soul into that project because I really, I really felt that I could help many people and the environment. When one day, by the end of the year, a teacher came to our class to talk about Catalars' accelerator program. And I got interested immediately, especially because I knew that Catalars was focusing on helping startups with so social impact. And I applied and I was so anxious, like looking forward to get the, 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 the results and I was accepted. I was so happy and I decided to stay in Australia for one more year. I was about to leave because I wasn't finding anything that I, that I wanted to do. I was just working those frustrating jobs that Usman mentioned before that I couldn't use my, my skills. So that was a sign that I should stay in Australia. And I extended my visa for one more year and did the, the, the program. And after a few weeks, I pivoted my idea one more time. And finally, my startup, Swapa Porte, was born. Uh, our mission is to untap the value of used clothes by providing an online platform, a platform for online clothing swaps. The idea is to launch a Tinder-like app where women can upload photos of clothes they no longer wear and swipe through other items from local like-minded people and swap once they get a match. By providing the service, we aim to help Australian women to dress with style without hurting the planet or their wallet. And here I am, that's what I'm working on the moment. And that was my introduction. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks very much, uh, Liana, for sharing your story, you know, and, and like the fact that you've gone through uh, from, you know, Brazil to Angola, um, then, you know, now here in Australia, we're very lucky to have you. Um, and obviously, I think this is such an important problem that you're trying to solve, which is, you know, clothing swaps, um, or, or no, not particularly clothing swaps, but like, you know, that's your solution, but more around like, you know, environmental sustainability and how, you know, fast fashion can be so destructive for the environment and the planet itself. Um, so well done. I think it's it's a fantastic initiative. And and for those of you um, who don't know, so Lana was actually a part of our um, pre center program in Melbourne, which was the first one we ran in Melbourne earlier this year. Um, so now she's actually going through an accelerator with YCAP, um, which is another amazing organization that supports social ventures, um, and particularly the ones started by migrants and refugees. So really great to have you here, Lana, and awesome to hear your story. Um, I know that both of you are at different stages of your journey, uh, but I know that, and which is sort of similar to people that are listening and tuning in. Um, so I would love to hear like some of the greatest lessons that you've learned on this startup journey so far. Um, and I know it will be different for different people, but yeah, I'm sort of curious from your perspective, what does that, what does that look like? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll lead off. I mean, for myself, really, it's, it's, it's learning about, you know, my limits was, was, was the biggest thing. Uh, you know, I always thought I could handle, you know, a certain amount of stress or a certain amount of, uh, you know, problem solving ability and things like that. And um, it wasn't until I started running my own businesses, really, then you know, I sort of really realized that, you know, where, where I thought my limits were, you know, was, was quite different. I could actually push myself a, a little bit more, uh, which, which can be dangerous sometimes too. Like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Leanna just mentioned before about pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. I think, yeah, you know, to, to be a startup founder or, or, you know, a business person, you really have to 
live outside that comfort zone quite a lot. And, you know, and sometimes that, that can be stressful, you know, and as, as you said before, you can cause, you know, mental health issues and things like that. So, um, uh, so for me, yeah, around that, I think was discovering, you know, the support systems that, that I could put in place to, to help me. So, you know, things like family, uh, and, and, you know, other, other colleagues in the same industry and, and you know, uh, groups like, like Catalyzer even. So, you know, it's, it's important to have, you know, support in all these different facets of your life, your, your personal life, uh, your business life, your spiritual life and, and things like that as well. So for me, it was all about learning about how to manage all that, you know, realizing that, yes, you know, I'm pushing myself a bit hard. Uh, I need help here. I need help there. And I guess, yeah, that, that whole ability of like asking for help, uh, you know, your ego and your pride normally says, you know, I, I can do this, you know, I'll just, I'll cope, I'll manage. But, uh, but for me, the biggest learning was realizing that, hey, you know, I, I can't do it all. I have to sometimes stop and ask for help and, you know, and putting the network in place for me was the uh, big learning. That's, that's so important. Um, and absolutely, I think it's essential to sort of focus on health and, and well-being. Um, and we talk about this, you know, that this is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, so, you know, when you start, you were thinking, well, you know, okay, I'm going to do this for six months or a few, a couple of years, but actually it's normally longer than that. Um, it probably takes at least two years to even understand the market properly, um, which I know that you can attest to, uh, Devin. Um, what about you, Leanna? What would be your greatest lesson so far? I, I agree with Devin. Um, and I think one of my lessons is what's helping me to overcome these, these challenges. The, the pressure that we all face as entrepreneurs. And for me, the, the biggest takeaway is hands-on training. My skills, uh, they have expanded so much in such a short period of time because I learn by doing. And I value con constructive feedback. For example, when, when I arrived in Australia three years ago, I couldn't speak English at all. And today I'm here at Spark Festival learning public speaking in a second language. So I try to see myself as a learner, as a learner all the time. And I'm not too worried about getting perfect results. And I'm eager to improve once someone more experienced shows me uh, what I could do better. And I think this kind of thinking takes away uh, some pressure of running a business and makes my learning experience much more effective and enjoyable. So it, it makes me able to run this marathon in a pace that I can follow. Absolutely. I think that, uh, so firstly, well done. Um, the fact that you didn't speak any English when you came here, you know, three years ago and, and, you know, like you're speaking perfect English now, just as a testament to your hard work. Um, and, and like, you know, that insane, like, you know, that, that sort of curiosity or, and learning, um, that they, you know, like that mindset that you have, uh, and you talk about it a lot in sort of the startup um, sort of land, but generally as well, it's this uh, con concept of growth mindset, which you mentioned previously around, you know, like being able to learn and, you know, whether that's the book learning or, you know, like hands-on work and, and learning from that. So, but it's fantastic to see, you know, like it's all the learnings that you've had. And obviously, you know, in our sort of exchanges as well in the last few months, I've sort of seen you take some of these ideas, um, and then, you know, change them based on feedback and improvement. And I think that that experimental mindset um, and the ability to tinker and prototype and develop something new um, is really what, what what's pretty unique, um, you know, skill set. Um, and that oftentimes make entrepreneurs, like differentiates successful entrepreneurs between with uh, some of the other entrepreneurs that unfortunately don't succeed. Um, because, you know, like you are able to let go, you are able to learn and are able to take feedback. So I think that's really, really useful, um, useful lessons that you mentioned there. Um, I know this is a topic that we don't want to talk about, but at the same time, this is a topic that we must talk about, which is uh, the sort of like, you know, the uh, elephant in the room, um, uh, COVID-19. Um, so I guess I would love to hear how has it affected you and your plans um, and what have you been doing about it? So, Leanna, do you want to share first? Yes, I can. Uh, the startup was born, my startup was born during COVID-19 crisis, so I don't have a benchmark to compare its impact to. However, despite the timing of my startup, the concept has still been gaining popularity. And the idea for online clothing swaps is actually a solution to cope with social distancing as clothing swap gatherings were canceled and op shops 
were not able to receive donations because of the lockdown. And I'm looking forward to seeing how the business will evolve once the world goes back to a normal status. Yeah, for, for us, uh, I'm actually really, I'm really com conflicted about about COVID nineteen because we're actually seeing our biggest growth on the back of COVID nineteen. Uh, you know, which is really a paradox. You know, I never expected that. But uh, yeah, you know, come come February when when, when the world sort of all fell apart and and, and lockdowns are happening you know, all over the place, uh, it just came to be that all these businesses realised they had all this. You know, their workforce suddenly went in the office. They were working remotely. They were working from home, or they had to hire people across the, the world to do the work and things like that. And so they needed an HR platform to uh, to help manage that. And so we suddenly found you know, a massive spike. We had like a 300% plus increase in our sign-up rates and everything else based on the back of COVID and purely because people needed an HR platform. And that to me, you know, just, just didn't sit right with me. Like, you know, if, you know, you hear about the stories about those ambulance chasing lawyers, you know, that live off other people's misery. And, you know, it sort of felt a bit like that. And for me, that, you know, that didn't make me feel comfortable at all. And uh, in fact, we had colleagues and, and mentors coming and telling us, uh, you should double your pricing, you know, you should, you know, the demand's there, so up your pricing and, and profit off this. But for, for me and my co-founder, like, you know, we were both quite ethically minded business people, you know, we've got pretty high principles. And so we actually did the opposite. We actually slashed our pricing. We halved our pricing and we told all these uh, businesses, look, you know, everyone's going to be struggling with this cash flow and if, uh, who knows how long. Uh, it's not going to be an easy time for anybody. So we're going to try and make your path a bit easier. We're going to cut our pricing in half and, and, and get you guys on board so you can start uh, using our system. And so for me, that was the way that, you know, I thought we could sort of give back. I mean, and, and try, you know, and, you know, because we're benefiting out of this, we want to give some of those benefits back to our, to our customer base. So, you know, that's made me sleep a little bit easier at night, I guess. Uh, and, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, as COVID has progressed, we've noticed a lot of the early people have signed up. You know, I've unfortunately had to close their businesses, some of them. And so, you know, we've lost a few customers, but the growth is still, you know, out, out of clips the, uh, the last. But, uh, you know, it's sad to see because, you know, I, I got into this business because I love talking to other business people, other start, uh, entrepreneurs and things like that. So, um, you know, it saddens me when, when people don't uh, don't uh, see it through. But, uh, but yeah, so we're just here to try and do our best and try and help as many businesses as we can through these uh, pretty, you know, horrendous times. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that, Devon. And I think it's so important to, you know, to be able to be have, I mean, you know, like to have, obviously have a sort of business mind and, and you know, focus on growth and all of that, but still, you know, have a have a heart as well at the, at the same time. Um, and, and, and I mean, you know, like, as you were saying, you know, it is a paradox, um, like given uh, the fact that, you know, like the world of nuclear Australia has very quickly realized how, many of our systems still, you know, belong in the 20th century um, and how many things, you know, that we were operating on and a lot of the things that are very legacy systems um, and have had to pivot and, and sort of move and digitize so quickly. I think that has definitely benefited a lot of the sort of online businesses and particularly SaaS platforms like yours. Um, so I think that's, that there's this sort of a part of this is, you know, there's a big opportunity, but at the same time, as you're saying that, you know, it's also you need to take care of your customers, particularly when they do have that cash crunch. Um, and I personally think that I think in the long run, that's that integrity and that um, that reputation that you build is something that's going to you know carry you through. Um, you know, so it's not it, it might not necessarily be profitable right now, but you know, three, four, five years down the line, I think this will be a huge, huge um, thing you can look back and say, look, you know, this is what we did. We did the right thing, and and not just uh, purely from like a uh, what's the right thing to do ethically, but also from like a business standpoint. I think it's just a smart decision. Um, so, but, but, you know, you like, I think it's like time will tell, um, and Lana as well. Thank you for sharing. I, I guess it's, it's important also to note here that, you know, as you said, you launched where, when COVID was happening. Um, and I think this is one of those things where as entrepreneurs, we are sort of inherently okay with uncertainty, um, I guess more so than some of the other people. Um, so, so, you know, like it's, I think it's probably a great time for people to launch, um, new businesses and for anyone thinking about an idea to launch something just because, I mean, a uh, unemployment rates are high, but also, you know, there's so many problems and needs that are emerging right now, uh, that I think that, you know, all of us could be doing a lot about, um, and, and that is opportunities both for social impact, as well as to, you know, to profit off it as well. Um, so, so, you know, so if you are an entrepreneur listening to this, if you've thought about, you know, doing something, I would definitely say. Um, consider that this can be a good time um, just to want something. Um, 
Um, and no matter what other people say, um, I'm also curious to hear from, from both of you's perspective, um, and you sort of mentioned this, Devin, around, you know, you supporting and being there for your, um, you know, businesses and, and sort of like your customers. So I guess similar questions to you, how can Catalyzer, but also the wider startup community that's listening to this help you, um, you know, um, in your own businesses, but also other aspiring migrant entrepreneurs on their journey, you know, particularly to, during this tough time? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that I've sort of got out of Catalyzer and other startup groups and, and other mentors and everything else is, is, that, is that support network, you know, because uh, as I mentioned before, you know, you're always living outside your comfort zone. You're always pushing, pushing, pushing. And, you know, when, when you're so immersed in your startup and you're running your business, you know, it's, it's easy to lose track of, you know, when to stop, when, when, when to pull back, you know. Sometimes you sort of confuse that persistence with the stubbornness, I guess, and, uh, you know, you can go a bit too far, go through burnout. I've been to burn out probably you know three times in my life and it's, it's not a pleasant thing at all and in all those times you know i had other people outside of me come come and stop and say look Devin, you know you should probably do something different try this try that uh and so yeah you know, as i mentioned before so you know you need your mentors around your, your business life you need your mentors around your personal life and maybe your physical health and, and things like that too so i think you know groups like catalyzer uh, you know are really invaluable to, to for that business knowledge you know like you know i wouldn't, I wouldn't go to my mum and, and try and get her to solve a business problem and i'd come to you know, my catalyzer friends and colleagues and mentors to, to do that because you know you got to choose who's going to support you in, in, in what ways you know uh, it, or if i'm not feeling well and i want a nice home-cooked meal that's and I'll go to my mum, you know, but, uh, but I don't know, you, you probably cook a mean curry yourself, Usman, I don't know, you, I hope you do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it's really, you know, that, that support from, from the Catalyzer Network. And like I said, even, you know, I did my uh, course, was it two years ago now? Um, um, but still, you know, to this day, you know, I'm friends with a lot of the other cohort members and, you know, yourself and, and, and you know, uh, other, other mentors still, I keep in touch on Twitter and LinkedIn and everything else. And, you know, I know I can reach out to them with a question or, you know, for a favor, like, you know, and, you know, and one example is, you know, Catherine from AWS, she, she gave us you know, a great deal on our hosting costs and things like that. And that really helped us to put money back into our marketing and, and grow the business and things like that. So, you know, from, from little things like that, or not so little, I guess, but from things like that to just, you know, a bit, a bit of advice every now and then, or just someone reaching out on Twitter and saying, hey, Devin, I see you've been pushing a little bit hard this last month, you know, just take some time out for yourself, maybe take you know, a week, week break or something like that. And then it's like, oh, you know, that's someone I respect giving me some, some great advice and I need to listen to that and to... Uh, and to manage that so you know, i think that that's one of the biggest sort of um, takeaways that i really love about the, this group thanks thanks devon um i mean i don't know about my sort of kai skills but i guess you'll have to come here and test it um to give me some feedback <laughs> uh maybe i can iterate and, and make it better in the future uh lana would love to hear um you know how can um, you know the startup community and catalyzer help you on your journey Sure. Uh, I think catalysis can help uh, entrepreneurs, especially like m myself, who are just starting with uh, supportive advice and also high valuable content during the master classes. So basically what we did at Catalysis was do the business model canvas in one day when I took three months to do it at school. And when we do it in that speed, we, we, we push ourselves, like uh, we go beyond our, our boundaries. Um, things like that uh, were, were really good. And as Stephen mentioned, the cohort, it's a, a, a crucial element. Uh, I felt so empowered in part participating in the cohort because as a migrant in Australia, I, I know how difficult it is to integrate and to overcome cultural and language barriers. And when we are surrounded by people who share the same struggles and the same values, we, we feel welcome, we feel uh, motivated and inspired. So the cohort was, was a, a crucial takeaway from, from myself as well. Thank you. And I think both of you have, met, have talked about this, which is the power of community and that power of network. 
Um, and I think it's a two-way street. So obviously, you know, you guys are very kind um, that you're talking about what you got, got out of it. But I'm sure if people talk to you about, you know, um, the program or about you, they will say the same thing. That Devon and Alana have also helped us in our sort of planning and our work and our uh, startups. Um, so, you know, also thank you for, for being there and for supporting others as well. I think it's so important um, to have that paid forward mentality too. Um, and, and I guess I, I also like, you know, for anyone who's listening, if you have any questions, feel free to sort of, you know, send them through Slido, um, you know, and sort of like take a look at that. Uh, but meanwhile, I obviously have a few different questions that I would love to ask. So this one um, that I'm particularly interested in asking you, Devin, is, um, you know, tell us about a time that you think you sort of failed at something, uh, particularly during your startup journey. You mentioned burnout uh, a couple of times, uh, but I'm just curious to hear, like, what would you consider a failure and like, what did you do about that? Oh gosh, how much time have we got, Usman? I could talk about failures for you know. I have many, like I have many, many failures, and uh, I, I, a lot of people may not realise, but I used to be a pilot, and when I was in my flying days, we used to have this saying that you know, as long as your number of landings is equal to your number of takeoffs, you're okay. If that number gets you know out of whack, then then you're in trouble. Uh, and and all, you know, the other thing, sort of extending from that, is like you know, any landing you can walk away from is, is a good landing. So. Uh, and that's not been my philosophy, really. Like, you know, I, I know I, I've made so many mistakes and, and I will continue to make mistakes as we grow. But uh, my, my mindset is now like not focusing on the actual mistakes per se or, or the errors that I've made uh, or the people I've let down. It, it's more about, okay, what can we learn from that? And once again, like, you know, from that aviation industry, you know, as you know, from watching like an you know, air crash investigation, all that, like, and every time there's a problem or an accident, you know, people just dive in and there's so much learning to, uh, to be gotten out of that. And then that learning is then applied so that it, you know, that problem never happens again, that accident never happens again. Uh, and I think that's important to, you know, take that philosophy into, you know, other uh, areas like in, in business and in, in life in general. Um, it's not about the blame game. It's really about, you know, learning. Yes, you know, things, things will go wrong, but if you learn and if you improve and you make sure it doesn't happen again and you can teach others not, you know, not to make the same mistakes, uh, that would certainly be, you know, a, a far better way to, way to go. So, um uh, yeah, so, so that's really, you know, how I approach you know, anything uh, these days because, you know, I, I know that, like I said, uh, as we grow, you know, there will be mistakes I make and, and things like that. But, you know, it's all about just learning from that and try, trying to preempt that by learning from others as well. So from, from the rest of the cohort and mentors and everything else as well and, and trying to just absorb as much as you can. I think, you know, Lena, you mentioned about, you know, always learning. You know, I'm probably twice your age, but I'm still learning you know, and I still will learn for another, you know, for the rest of my life. And the day I stop learning is the day they nail my coffin shut, really. That's what I always tell my, my family anyway. So it's all about just, you know, enjoying that, that learning process and, and, and enjoying learning from others. You know, everyone you meet can teach you a lesson, really. So. I think I think that that last point is like everyone you can meet can teach you a lesson is such a such a key point and absolutely that like infinite learning mindset is so important um, and I really like you know obviously you've reframed that all failures are opportunity for learning um, unless you get to catastrophic failure so you talked about the airplane example uh, which I sort of agree but I think that oftentimes when, when whenever people think about failure and risk they often look at it. Uh, you know, in the sort of wrong way because you know they don't think about the best case, or the worst case scenario. Um, uh, because if you do, you will realize in most sort of situations the worst case scenario isn't that bad, and that gives you the confidence and empowers you to actually you know take um, action and to you know go through with whatever you're thinking. And there are a lot of business ideas and a lot of ideas in general that die in people's heads um, and unfortunately never make it to paper, let alone you know somewhere. Um, like that they're executed. Um, so I would definitely want to challenge anyone who's listening to to use this opportunity to think about what is something, a crazy idea that you have um, that you might have been thinking about or you might have sort of like, you know, worked a little on um, that gets you, you know, excited, but at the same time you think it's too risky. Um, and really genuinely ask yourself the question, is it too risky and what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, you know, um, and also, you know, obviously from, from your sort of previous failures, think about them and think about the learnings that you can get out of them. Um, and how can you do things better in the future? So I think that's such a valuable lesson. Um, um, Leanna, sort of my question to you is around founders um, and particularly sort of entrepreneurs. Uh, what do you think are, are sort of successful attributes that you think every successful entrepreneur or founder has? Uh, I think a successful founder is resilient. Uh, he has or she has the capacity to adapt and recover quickly 
and I believe most of migrants uh, have this quality. I, I, I completely agree. I think it's such an important aspect. Um, and uh, and I see that we also have some questions coming in from, from the uh, slide as well. So thank you for, for sending those questions. I'll sort of come to them in a minute. Um, I am, uh, I guess I'm sort of like uh, curious to hear uh, from you, Devin, you've mentioned this um, a few times now, which is um, the sort of advice that you've gotten from different mentors and supporters and community. Um, so I guess my sort of question is, um, if you had to sort of boil it down to the, like that one best piece of advice that you've been given through your journey, um, that you want to follow, uh, I guess, like, oh, uh, yeah, just share it with um, aspiring micropreneurs, what would that be? Sure. I, th I think uh, that's something that someone told me like early on. I think when I started my very first business, uh, a friend of mine said, you know, just don't take your eye off the ball and I always keep your eye on the ball. And uh, I, I didn't sort of appreciate that until probably about 10 years later, how important that was because, you know, all, all of us have our, you know, the things that we like to do and things we don't like to do. So, you know, as, as a business owner, I love, you know, like I said, talking to other business people and running a business and, and writing code and things like that. I actually hate doing like my, you know, accounting and my tax and, and seeing my, you know, financial advice. And, and things like that. So I tend to like you know, leave that you know, in the too hard basket and, and, and not look at the financials and things like that. And usually until it's it's too late and so then you can't plan forward. So, you know, for me, it's all about, okay, sometimes you've got to suck it up and, and, and just do the things you don't enjoy sometimes and make sure that, you know, if it's something that you, you don't like doing, you just have to like, you know, you have to swallow the frog. You have to just wake up and, and just, just go ahead and do it or, or hire someone that can do it. But, you know, even then, don't delegate by, you know, uh, by absence, really, you need, you need to keep your eye on it. You need to, you know, make sure that all aspects of your business are running, and just don't take your eye off any of the metrics or the KPIs. So that's one of the things that I'm really big on now with with HR Partner, especially we've set up you know a whole bunch of different KPIs and everything else, and I've got people managing it, and we have regular meetings to, to stop. You know, I'm not a meetings guy either. Like I hate meetings, but you know, we've made it so that we have weekly meetings and we catch up and we actually talk about you know everything, the marketing, the, the finances, the the, the the, the development, the, the, the servers, everything else, uh, so that you know we, we're on top of everything and, and we know all the metrics and important uh, pointers in the business. I, I think that's so important. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of founders start by doing things that they love and something they're passionate about. But I think it's absolutely important to you know obviously once you sort of validate what you're doing, move from a founder to a CEO. Um, and so that aspect uh, where you're mentioning around, you know, like not taking eye off the ball, really making sure that you know your numbers, you know your metrics, um, doesn't mean that you have to do it all. As you sort of saying, you, you, you know, you can find the best people who can help you, who can delegate that, um, or you can sort of delegate that work too. But at the same time, you at least need to know that that's something um, that, you know, that needs to be looked at. So it's a great piece of advice. Um, there's a question in the chat, which is if you could go back, uh, if you could go back to talk with, uh, Liana and Devon from sort of five years ago, what piece of advice would you give them? So Liana, do you want to take that on? The What was the question, like uh, the advice that I would give to Devon? No, the advice that you would give to yourself if you went and like back to in myself? time five years ago. To yourself, yes. Okay, five years ago, I was in Angola. I think I took I took the advice that I gave me back that time that was uh, find out what make me happy and explore the world, explore possibilities and do not regret because there was a time that I, I regretted. I felt that I failed when I was in Angola. And now I understood that uh, I need to fail to to discover myself and to be here now. Thanks, Liana. Thank you for sharing. Devin, what about yourself? What advice would you I give for your before I get my answer, I just got to say, Lana, that that's a beautiful sentiment. Like, find out what makes you happy. I think a lot of people just don't don't realize that. I didn't realize that until you know, probably uh, seven or eight years ago. I was running my other business for like thirty years, and you know, writing code for other people. But I didn't realize that what would make me happy was writing code for myself and building my own system. So. I said that as a bit of a throwaway line, but I want to go back and revisit that because that, that is so important. 
Um, uh, for, for me, I, I guess, you know, what I would have told myself five years ago is uh, I, something you said just then, uh, as one earlier on, is that, you know, it always takes longer than you think it, it's going to take. Uh, like, you know, I thought, yeah, I'd set up this SaaS business and, you know, in one year, two years, I'd be, you know, welcoming millions of dollars in venture funding and, and just be traveling the world and, and things like that. You know, I, I just was a bit arrogant to, to assume that. And, uh, but, you know, I wasn't quite prepared for the grind that it was going to be, especially those first maybe three, four years. I think that the grind was just quite tough. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I did see it through in the end, but I wish, you know, someone had taken me aside and said, look, Devin, you know, your expectations are probably set a bit high, just pull them back a little bit, but it's going to be hard work, but, you know, you'll get through it. And, you know, I look at it now, five years down the track, and it's, you know, I'm, I'm getting to where I thought it was going to be two years ago. So it's, it's nice to be here now. Uh, but it was also it also would have been nice to to hear back then that okay just set your expectations right so you don't you know push too hard and and get too dejected and give up too early. I think they're both both amazing pieces of advice. Doing what makes you happy, um, and secondly, you know it always takes longer than you think. I think if you if you if you were to write something you know on a piece of paper or your whiteboard, I've got a whiteboard in the background. Um, then, you know, I, th th that would be those two aspects or those two things, like do what makes you happy. Um, and, you know, it always takes longer than you think. I think that's such a common story amongst entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, this is such one of those things that you re you only learn it by being in that experience, but oftentimes we don't talk about, um, that, you know, you shouldn't compare yourself to like a pretty cool story, a new story that's coming out, because oftentimes that is the outlier and not the sort of mean or median case. Um, so it's really important to know that, you know, for a lot of people, um, on average, it will take longer um, just because, the, you know, there's a lot of complexities involved in building a business and it's definitely not as easy as you think. Um, I, I also have a question, which is also about five years into the future. So this is more around, you know, so what is the sort of next five years looking like for you, uh, Liana, and then for you, Devin, uh, for your businesses respectfully? Who should start? Oh, you can start, Lana. Okay. Uh, in five years, I I see Swapa Porte strong in all Australia. Uh, I'd like to to start with Melbourne and then conquer Sydney, Brisbane, um, Adelaide, and after these five years, be able to to go to the first international market. Yeah, and for me, it's uh, it's all about just you know, keep keeping growing because uh, I'm having such such fun now, and, you know, actually having fun building the business. That uh, you know, we had, in just this month actually we had a couple of people uh, contact us and say, look, you know, are you interested in investment, or, or buying you out, and things like that. And my co-founder and I both talked about it and gone, look, no, you know, we're actually having so much fun now that we don't think uh, you know we really want to commit too early to you know selling out of the business or anything else like that. Sure, you know, maybe in. Uh, in, in five years' time, the plan is to, to make an exit at some stage, uh, you know, getting bought out by, by a big payroll company or someone like that. So that, that's our ideal exit. But you know, right now, yeah, so we're just having so much fun building, you know, growing our team, growing our customer base, learning so much. Uh, you know, I think the values, you know, can, can still get better in HR partners. So now I'm thinking like in two to three years time, we'll have a much better value proposition to go to, you know, some of these investors with and say, hey, look, you know, we are 10 times the company we were back in 2020. Uh, so I'd really like to, to see it through. You know, I'm the sort of guy that would get bored if I did nothing. So, I'd, you know, I couldn't like retire in, in five years time. I don't think even if I did sell the business in five years, I'd go out and look for another startup or, you know, invest in someone else and, and carry on, I think. Yeah. So that's a that's a sort of great segue to sort of like my last question, and this is to you, Devin, specifically uh, around if you had to sort of launch a new startup today, given that you've been doing this for a while now, uh, what what idea would you work on and why? And we've got two minutes. Well, uh, I'll keep your answer short. Yeah, that's a great question. I probably mean something like in robotics. Uh, my, my dad was a do highly respected doctor, and I see the effect that you know he had on the community by saving lives and, and doing things like that. I love to do something in that same sort of field using technology as well. So yeah, I think robotics, bionics, that sort of thing, like helping people who have am amputees and people who are paralyzed to, to walk again and things like that. I love to get into that that technology. I'd say. Awesome. Well, thank you both of you for taking the time and for everyone who's you know tuned in and listening to us. Uh, it's been fantastic talking to you to hear a bit about your story, what what you know, what you're passionate about, what you've been working on, some of the amazing lessons you've learned, um, and I think there's a lot to take away for 
um, you know, both aspiring micropreneurs, but also the general ecosystem and people who are listening today. Um, so thank you. Um, congratulations on all of the, you know, hard work and successes and the work that you've done so far. Um, and I wish you all the best um, as well for, for the sort of months and years to come. Thank, thank you, Usman. Thank you for all and nice to meet you, Devan. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you, Lana. Thank you. <laughs>